Hi, I'm Don. We're here at Point One in sunny Rogersville, Missouri today. Um, I'm here with Shannon and Tim, and we're looking forward to uh, sharing a little bit with you about what it takes to uh, bring heat, heat treat in-house. Hi everyone, welcome to this session in uh, eSeminar 4.1. My name is Don Martini. Uh, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking today about uh, what it takes to uh, bring heat treating into uh, your operation. Glad you could join us. Um, with me today, I've got two uh, guests, uh, Tim Josephs from Production Technologies International and Shannon Strother from Point One. Um, They've been uh, kind enough to join us today and uh, tell us a little bit about the, um, the operation here. Uh, uh, with that, Tim is uh, actually a Seco Vacuums representative in the Northwest, excuse me, uh, Midwest uh, area for the, the US market. And uh, Shannon is the operations manager here at uh, Point One. Uh, thanks for joining us again, guys, today. My pleasure. Um, with that, uh, we'll start the conversation uh, off with, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Point One and kind of the, the evolution of the business here uh, as it sits today? Sure. Um, thanks for asking. We, um, you know, we founded the company, um, you know, ground up new business to uh, make the best, highest performance parts mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that, that, are, that are available as far as we're concerned. And uh, that's going to cross over multiple channels, but uh, motorsports is definitely our focus uh, starting out. Okay, and um, within that, you know, you're saying fasteners. So, was there a, a, a particular market you were going after in the motorsports sports arena, or was it just in general? Uh, we think all markets. I mean, uh, you know, even at the retail level and stuff like that, the head studs and the main studs. Okay. But certainly, uh, working with teams uh, in high performance at the uh, highest end of the sport. Um, you know, we that's those are uh, relationships that we already have and we cater to, so we think that's uh, that's a good place for us to begin. So it was basically a bunch of uh, um, gearheads got together and you guys decided to hey we've got an idea here we think we can make it work and we're going to run after it right. We intrigued we were certainly intrigued by how difficult some of these parts are to make and uh, what you have to go through to uh, acquire the knowledge uh, to, to make them successfully. Oh, interesting. So. You know, obviously, um, you know, bringing heat treat in house is not that's a, that's a challenge in and of itself. Um, what made you do that, and did you have any background in it really before that, or, or no? Um, you know, some some folks on our team have been around heat treat, but uh, nobody uh, ever heat treated professionally. Um, nobody ever worked in a shop where heat treat, you know, as far as production heat treat was uh, a part of the picture. Um, so it was a, a massive decision. It was probably the biggest decision we made um, when we were starting to think about this business. Um, um, you know, it's one of the largest investments uh, also. Okay. And so, uh, you know, it was a long process. Uh, we're fortunate to come across uh, good partners and uh, excellent team uh, to put something that's like this together. But, um, you know, we really felt like, um, you know, for us, it's about having control of the quality and fidelity and timeline and the things that our customers care about um, we wanted to be able to do exactly what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. Um, and so that's, that's the overriding factor. Well, yeah, because, I mean, you, you could have gone to a commercial heat treater, right? I mean, th these services are available uh, elsewhere. and uh, At a lower cost. At a lower cost. Uh, you know, also, they've got experience, right? I mean, they do this every day, all day. Uh, but, you know, so the quality meant that much to you. Absolutely. And... Um, and, and, and I think the control is, is the other thing. I mean, we wanted to know um, that if, if we treated our parts uh, in heat treat the way we treated them through the rest of our processes, um, that you know we had a, um, a good chance of, of getting exactly what we wanted. And we wanted to be able to experiment and, and in some ways create our own recipes um, okay. to, to, to meet the demands that our customers are asking for. Yeah. It Tim, in your travels, do you do you see that that type of uh, situation coming up too, where you know the customer has been been having an issue, and they come to you and say, "Hey, 
you know, we've, we've had a, either a timing problem or a quality problem with our, with our you know, relationship with our commercial heat treater. Um, you know, can you help us? Is that a, a typical scenario? Yeah, I mean, and, uh, I mean, that's a great question, Don, because, you know, a lot of times uh, people call us on the equipment side of things because they are having some issues with their outside source because of quality or mm -hmm. timing or just overall ease of doing business. And, you know, that's one of the typical reasons why we get the call you know, different than, say, this case. If we have a customer that currently has heat treating, um, either being done outside, um, if they're looking for new equipment, typically as a, as a result of one of those three items. Okay, so let's let's assume that someone does come to you with that question. Um, what's the general process you might take them through in order to, you know, start them considering all the items that need to be uh, in, in bringing in uh, or heat treating in-house? Sure, so I mean, great question. So I run into this every day in my line of work mm -hmm. um, as a primarily a capital equipment, a heat processing, heat engineer, heat equipment uh, mm -hmm. uh, sales representative is that people, one or two things happen. We either have people come to us with a fairly well-defined specification where they say, this is what we have, this is how we do it, build me the exact machine to do this. Mm -hmm. Or they come to us, in the case of ED, um, circuitous through a, a heat treat consultant who helped you know, establish, get you guys some basic information of what ED didn't know. Mm -hmm. He helped bring them up to speed as to what they didn't know so that they had to do their research. Mm -hmm. They came upon SECO Vacuum, uh, us as one of the, you know, the initial parties involved with the project and said basically, start from a green field, a blank sheet of paper, what do we need? Mm -hmm. So it's typically one of the two, or a slight modification of, of mm -hmm. one of those two options. Mm -hmm. um, so each of them has its own challenge. Uh, typically, if they come to us with already understanding, you know, they've got some preconceived notions of what they want or what they need. Um, it may not be as current at the times as this case. The nice thing about working with ED in point one was, you know, what we did know is they wanted to build a first class world quality shop they wanted the best in technology and they were willing to invest in it knowing that this was the long term was to do it right up front and to try to limp along because of the cost right right and um okay so shannon you know what was that even at the initial stage of this when you were considering you know bringing heat treat in-house what was that first step that you that you took? I mean, even prior to, to working with the outside consultant or, or Tim, I mean, was it literally a, hey, I, I have to go crack a book and start reading? Or was it I attended a seminar or something like that? How did that roll out? Obviously, we have an owner who's very passionate about the details. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and we have a few other guys, obviously, we're all, um, I would say, uh, uh, fairly nerdy. Mm -hmm. But uh, like all good searches uh, for information, we probably started on the internet, mm -hmm. um, you know, watching some YouTube videos and uh, doing some basic research about um, you know, what kinds of equipment do you need, what are the companies that, uh, that represent this kind of equipment, um, who are the parties who help bring the whole project together. Um, and obviously we uh, started with a consultant um, who led us down the path um, to talking to uh, you know, multiple vendors and ultimately to, uh, to you guys. And um, we're fortunate to, to, to come across that probably pretty early on in the process. And uh, obviously as we started working towards um, honing in the uh, scope of work or what the whole project looked like, um, you know, then it became a, a matter of the details and the budgets and sure. timelines. Yeah, so you, you went to, from operations manager to project manager is what you're saying, right? Right, that's correct. Right. <laughs> it's a big project. Uh, well, you did a wonderful job. Um, you know, one thing too, um, at what point were you convinced that, um, you know, taking that step was the right step? Because obviously, you know, actually, I'm kind of shocked that you saw a lot of information that was valuable on the internet that, you know, uh, was detailed enough that you could actually start making some decisions. You know, um, how how far did that get you before you said, "Hey, we've got to go get some real help with this"? That's exactly the point. Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, uh, you led me well. I think. <laughs> um, you know, we didn't find the kind of detail that we needed. Um, you know, we knew uh, nearly immediately, even though we're um, in other aspects of manufacturing, we knew that this was more complex, um, you know, um, certainly something we need to learn a lot more about from folks who were experts. So you guys, you weren't by any stretch 
didn't really know anything about heat treating. I mean, your background was machining? No. Uh, correct. Okay. And um, in manufacturing other components, not even related to metal products, I would say okay. uh, is really what our team's uh, history is. Okay. But we didn't know anything about SECO. Okay. Uh, you know, we didn't know anything about vacuum versus atmosphere heat treating. Um, you know, we just uh, knew that we wanted to, we, w we knew from the ground up that we wanted to have control um, of the of the quality of the parts, and mm -hmm. and and second to that only, uh, just barely is controlling the timeline. And so, you know, I think we 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 knew that we had to do it. And so, after that, it's really just finding the information uh, relevant to deciding who's the best partner and stuff like that. Okay, um, interesting. That that um, <clears throat> Tim, when you when you you know have that same experience do you get that commonly or is it usually customers got a lot more knowledge of of heat treating and kind of what they want which one do you see more often happen you know are they experienced customers or are they new to the the whole heat treating um, aspect of the business i would say years ago i've been in the business for over 30 years mm -hmm. selling heating related products mm -hmm. and you know, between ovens and furnaces and so forth sure and working on greenfield projects and uh, I would say years ago, the customers were much more informed because they had a better understanding of their process. Okay. Because they've been doing it for so long. Sure. You know, I'm primarily an automotive guy, having spent most of my time in, in the upper Midwest, in mm -hmm. the middle part of the country, um, versus say aerospace. Um, you know, these guys would work at these companies for 25, 30 years, been mentored by guys that have been before them. I mean, it was like Stone Age heat treating back in uh -huh. the day. It was modern day, you know, it was literally Stone Age stuff. Yeah. You know, so they understood the process a lot more. Uh, in a lot of cases, knew more about the equipment than the vendors did. Today, I would say it's far from the truth. It's probably the opposite mm -hmm. because uh, uh, manpower, uh, a lot of the, the process knowledge has retired or died even mm -hmm. in some cases. Uh, this is not a glamorous field, but there's a good living to be made at it. Um, but there's not as many people coming into this field. Uh, you, you, know, you don't see a whole lot of father-son teams. You know, the father has been working for the company and the son comes sure. in and basically that's all they talk about at dinner. Sure. And with that being said, I had one guy this week and it was his son and his dad. Was, but, it happens, you know, right? And, there you uh, go. But the, um, and today, most of the companies I'm calling on, the engineers wearing a heat treat hat, wearing a machinist hat, wearing a finishing hat, uh, an assembly hat. So heat treat isn't their forte. Mm -hmm. They know enough to be dangerous, um, but they have to rely on folks such as ourselves that mm -hmm. have been around a little bit longer. Um, and I'm in a fortunate position, having been in this field for 30 years, and so I can come in and as we did on this case, we said, hey, let's move the equipment around a little bit. I just know this is gonna be a little tight here for the loader. You know, those are the kind of nuances that, you know, people that have been around long enough, you know, bring to the table. Sure. And um, so, you know, it's not bad, it's just different. So we have to adjust as we we're talking about earlier. I think to add on to what Tim said, I mean, you know, as we got deeper into the discussion and we and we talked to all the vendors that we felt like were relevant to the process in, the, sure. in, in that discussion, we, we learned that it's not just one formula, it's not just one recipe, it's not just one alloy for us. The, the variety of things that we have to learn, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's reams of information. And so, um, again, that's just why we relied uh, so heavily on our partners and vendors. Uh, to put something like this together. It really is, I mean, for us, you know, we're not just doing one kind of heat treat on one kind of product. I mean, we're spread across many, many, many different materials and different kinds of processes and recipes. Right, so your your situation was kind of unique in that you didn't really know exactly what your product was gonna be, right? Certainly. So, So the versatility was important for you. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and uh, that, I guess, brings the curiosity to my mind is, Tim, how often do you see that being a need? You know, is it usually, okay, you walk in, they've got the process defined, this is what we want, or is versatility important? And moreover, uh, with the role of technology starting to become more and more um, prevalent, you know, as far as, hey, uh, you know, let's take our, our car, for instance, you know, I can get in and I can plug in my phone and I can get a, you know, navigation and music and everything else. 
you know, is that kind of technology making a big impact in, in the heat treating equipment arena? Yeah, versatility is always key, you know, <laughs> and, and I knew this and, and you were involved with this sure. a little bit up front as well, yeah. is that knowing, again, knowing that they didn't know what they were going to be building down the road, we had to, you know, design as much versatility into the project without it being financially irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Um, because that does come into play, sure. You know, on, especially on an investment like this, where you're not just building the heat treat, you're building the building, you're building other forming equipment. You know, there's you know some budgetary param, you know, constraints. Regardless, sure. Um, but the versatility was key um, with with what we talked about because we started talking about certain products that were this, and I think by the time we were done, we were dealing with products that were this. And maybe even this or our, this. Our list got longer and longer. Our list got longer. As we, we can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we tried to build as much you know, versatility into the system as well. But, um, and then I'm sure we'll talk about it in a little bit here, the, the technology. We did, you know, the, the system's got the latest and greatest in technology and the, the industry 4.0 and mm -hmm. uh, the monitoring and, and the controls and the, and the parameter monitoring. Uh, so when we designed the system, we, we certainly, uh, Steve was a visionary and knew exactly what he wanted this thing to look like. It was up to us, between the three of us and some mm -hmm. others, to get us where we needed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but the system had, you know, the, the tools built into it to address the, the current trend of the Industry 4.0, mm -hmm. as far as the system monitoring, the diagnostics, the PM, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the other things that go along with it, uh, where all the, all, most of the equipment that's here has that technology built into it. So, you know, a guy like Shan, who's doing the same thing that you mentioned before, he's got multiple hats. Um, do you see that technology kind of helping someone like him, you know, fill in some of those gaps where, like you said in the previous, where, hey, we had a whole team of, of uh, you know, people that had been doing this for a long time and they all had their, their niche in the operation uh, and they knew what to do. We don't have that anymore. Now we have some, you know, fewer people doing more do you see that technology? Yeah, well, in? in this project specifically, we talked quite a bit about the SQL predictive, yep. um, which for them was a, a huge advantage from the fact for numerous things because they're brand new to the process. And if we needed to help them out along the way, instead of sending someone from our office, you know, to Springfield, which we all know is not easy to get to, and it's not, you know, it's a, more than a one day trip. This helps minimize potential downtime mm -hmm. or assistance, and the fact that too that you know finding staff nowadays is a challenge as much as anything, and, and maintenance personnel and, and other people to maintain the equipment. The SQL Predictive allows them, gives us the tool to help minimize or to help uh, ease the maintenance that's going to be required on the system as they're going on. And quite frankly, they're in the business of. Of making their high performance parts they're they don't want to have sit and have to worry about maintaining the furnace sure. so with the, the system the tools in place it helps minimize you know the limited resources that they have to focus on where they're making the money right. versus trying to chase the tail and that's that's the whole name of the game anyway right we're, we're trying to Absolutely. run a business um okay so when you started this process just roughly speaking you know, from the time you started investigating, investing in heat treat versus furnaces sitting here on the floor, how long? How long did that take? I think uh, from the time uh, we uh, we were committed, I think uh, we were only seven months or so, seven or eight months, something like that. Okay. Uh, from start to finish. Okay. And um, it was pretty quick. It was very quick for the size of and, the investment. Uh, obviously, you know, we were under construction, so we, you know, we I think we probably pressed on your team a little bit there. To uh, to okay. to meet the guide or meet the deadlines that we were setting for ourselves as far as the construction of the facility, uh, but uh, it all worked out really really well and, and thankfully, um, you know we we definitely performed on schedule and I'm uh, I'm happy to say that was a, a huge a huge undertaking to get to get that right. You know, that's that's a great job because we all know how uh, those projects can can run sometimes yeah. right. There's always uh, you know surprises good or bad that happen along the way. <laughs> well, we hope they're mostly good. Yeah, um, I, I had noted here that, yes. so I was looking at my notes last night. Sure. Our, my initial contact with you and Steve was in July of 2018. And then the order was actually received in September. Yeah. And it, as you know, and I mean, uh, it, it I was going moved to say, fairly quickly, but the, the beauty was we had the decision makers in the meetings 
knew what was going on and we didn't have to wait for corporate approvals and you know, we're dealing directly with the owner so things moved along at a very accelerated rate compared to what I would typically see. Yeah. And then basically the, the equipment was, we had everything here in, in under a year. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, that's credit to you guys, I mean, because we were able to get the kinds of information, the, the detailed information and uh, I mean, the, the other resources, the other members of the team that are here. I mean, we were able to gather up that information and get the kind of information back to us uh, mm -hmm. in a way that was very timely. And so this didn't just, the project didn't just sit around and linger um, in space. I mean, we, you know, there was things going on every single week. Yeah. And uh, hey, I'll ask this, we get this information, oh, that creates another question. Um, and so um, that's an amazing tribute to the team of people that I think we had working on it together. Well, and we appreciate that. And, and from my, you know, my input to that whole situation, I will say it, it developed very quickly too. And, um, you know, being, you know, I think being in that position where we had those conversations on a, a weekly basis um, definitely helped keep things rolling. I mean, there's so so many times uh, the there are so many people involved in so many different levels, right, that it takes some time for the, the decisions to develop. And yeah, definitely in this case, it was very unique. That's not the only thing you're doing. It's not the only thing we're doing either. Right, right. Uh, exactly. you know, you're, you're, you're trying to attack multiple projects at the same time. And obviously, with a building project, um, you know, we had a lot of projects at sure. the same time. OK, um, before, we, before we leave this topic, um, one last question. Well, maybe two. First one, what, what surprised you the most? I mean, you no. Know, coming from the background you had, right? You know, mostly machining. What was the the like? Oh, I didn't see that coming. Uh, moment in this whole thing. I think the, uh, you know, I think the uh, the installation itself and the infrastructure required mm -hmm. um, was a little bit surprising. I mean, you know, the the roof penetrations and the, the different process gases mm -hmm. and uh, the quantities and volumes and pressures. Um, you know, you know that could be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, but um, again, you know, with the help of the guys that, uh, that made it possible, I mean, uh, I feel like, you know, we got 99% of that right on the first go. And, um, you know, and it was fun, fun for me to learn for something new. And it is, it's, it's a fun project to, uh, to have been a part of, but um, I really feel like uh, that's probably the, the most complex thing. Okay. Uh, that, that, good. That's, that's good to, uh for us too, I think, as, as the uh, equipment providers. Um, and I actually, I will say from, from my experience with this project, I definitely uh, took that as a lesson learned to say, hey, you know, be aware of some of those, uh, shall we say, sideline items that, that come up later in the game, right? Uh, that, that need to be addressed. A lot of times we don't think about it, right? right. Um, so that was definitely a good experience for me too on, on you know, the finishing touches, the last, the last mile, shall right. I say. Um, last thing, I think, uh, I would you do it again? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, we're far enough along now to know for sure that uh, we got a lot of it right. And, and again, tribute to you, to you guys, you know, with that, for, for that, for Thank sure. You. But um, we, uh, we absolutely would do it again. And uh, we feel like um, we've already uh, justified the investment um, in terms of the energy that we put into the project and obviously the capital. Mm -hmm. uh, we feel like it was, um, it was uh, time and money well spent. Great, great. Well, with that, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back to talk a little bit about the equipment you see behind us and uh, explain to you the, the logic behind why it was chosen. So we'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to our discussion uh, about the investments uh, needed for uh, bringing heat treat in-house. Uh, again, I'm Don Martini. Nice to have you. Um, joined again with Shannon and Tim here uh, at uh, Point One, and we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, as I, I mentioned in the previous interview, uh, the equipment involved in uh, setting up a heat treat shop. With that. Um, 
let's go back a few years, back to the July 2018. I think Tim, you mentioned in the last discussion, um, you came to us, said, "Okay, now what? What do we need? Yeah, here's what we want to do. What do we need?" Um, Tim, what's your first step? How does that usually work when when you have a customer approach you with that question? Well, I think you know, Don is the um, the first thing is what kind of what's the process going to be? You have mm -hmm. to define what the process is. So it, again, as we're talking about customers and know what they want, they can define the process. But in this case, we had some ideas of mm -hmm. what you know you were going to eventually be doing, and so we had to look at it and say, okay, what what type? Knowing what we know as furnace and equipment guys knowing the processes that they want to run and the requirements that they're going to have, we had an idea of what direction that we were going to steer the customer towards for, for their purchase. The, the choices you know, in, in today's you know, market is basically atmosphere, heat treat, or mm -hmm. heat treat. Right, right. So kind of to make that decision, Shannon, can you refresh our memory a little bit on you know what you were thinking then as far as what the processes looked like, what a little bit of your product was going to be? And as I remember, there was quite a broad range there is uh, and there was the uh, I mean obviously for us it's more about finding limits sometimes than uh, what's <laughs> yeah. what's not included yeah, than right. what than, uh, the rather than what is yeah. and so we you know we did want to find the practical constraints to what we can and can't do and obviously we've planned for, for future processes and future materials that that we're not even using yet today mm -hmm. but um, you know obviously um, you know the quality and fidelity fidelity of the parts and distortion control um, and other things um, that, that drive you towards considering the vacuum purchase, um, you know, obviously I think that was, that was key. And I think again, pretty quickly in the process, we realized that that was probably the direction that we needed to go. Right, so, you know, you mentioned high, high performance fasteners. Um, obviously, <laughs> the straighter they are coming out of heat treat, out of hardening, the less work you have to do after the fact, right? right. So that was a real key, a key consideration for you, right? Right, all of these fasteners you have to touch you know, sometimes eight or ten or eleven or twelve, thirteen times, and so if you can eliminate a step or two mm -hmm. uh, by uh, you know sort of getting another benefit of uh, of your vacuum or your or your heat treat system, your heat treat process, um, obviously that was key for us. Right, and you know you mentioned kind of that finding the limits. Um, you know, does that mean different materials as far as things like stainless? To, you know, high carbon to maybe even some low carbon stuff. If you decide to go into that direction, is that kind of what you were thinking? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we have a, 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 a core set of materials that we know is uh, is commonplace in the industry today. Right. Um, but we want to pioneer new ground and want to be able to take advantage of uh, of uh, new and and forthcoming research and new alloys and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, we want to be able to do just about anything. Um, we want to be able to process anything that's already available and certainly things that we haven't even thought of yet. Right, so cleanliness uh, both inside and outside the furnace uh, was, was a key consideration for you, right? Yeah, we, uh, we are in an air-conditioned facility. It's climate uh, controlled 24 seven. I mean, that's part of our quality control as well, but it's not, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's part of the way um, that, you know, it's part of the, the benefits for our staff, but it's certainly a benefit for our environment. Um, you know, the vacuum is just a cleaner, um, a cleaner process, yeah. obviously, it, easier on our utility bill. Yeah, so I guess the fire breathing uh, normal IQ furnace wasn't going to fit that bill, would it Tim? <laughs> we pulled <laughs> we, uh, that out right from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. was definitely, uh, we, we didn't need much uh, persuasion yeah. To, yeah. Uh, to, to go away from that. Yeah. Oh, good. Understood. Um, well, with that, um, you know, actually behind us here, we do have a furnace that, that is similar to uh, uh, an IQ, matter of fact, it is a, a, a vacuum uh, interval punch furnace. Um, uh, you know, obviously since we're doing such a wide range of uh, materials, some of those might be able to be uh, uh, high pressure quenched, some of them maybe not, right? Right, yeah, I mean obviously some of our materials uh, quench easily in gas and uh, some of them uh, don't. So mm -hmm. having an oil quench furnace just gives us more versatility and uh, control of the cost in some cases where it's just, you just want a more cost effective process right. um, versus uh, you know, quenching in gas. Right. So Tim, uh, obviously, you know, you bring oil into the mix with vacuum. Uh, isn't as straightforward as the high pressure quench process, is it? I mean, as far as material preparation for going into the furnace, coming out of the furnace, going into subsequent processes, 
what special considerations did they really need to take in preparing for having this furnace as part of the equipment mix here? Yeah, so I mean that leads into the cleanliness and the, and the prep uh, of the material. So, you know, as with any vacuum process, you know, and we've talked about this and, and the system was laid out with this in mind, is you need to have clean parts going into the vacuum. It does require a cleaner part. Uh, you know, it's it's less forgiving in that regard than, uh, say, an atmosphere furnace. You can yeah. throw dirty parts in them and just let the let, it, let everything burn off. You know, it does it has its own cleaning system. But yeah. uh, in this case, so when when the system was designed, um, one of Steve and Shannon's requirements was let's you know we're going to do it. Let's do it right. So mm -hmm. we had the floor space and uh, we designed it with a, a pre and a post wash. And so we were able to clean the parts going into the vacuum, mm -hmm. whether it's oil quench or the gas quench. Mm -hmm. And then specifically for the oil quench system, we had the post wash system. So we wanted to keep the two segregated so that we're not dirtying up the, uh, the, the pre-system or the, the pre-wash system yeah. with a bunch of quench oil after the fact so we can maintain cleanliness and extend the bath life. So uh, as I think we've got one of those uh, washers actually here to our uh, our left. Um, Tim, can you give us kind of a rundown on on what that actually takes uh, to have a successful wash? Uh, you know, and and you know, what about the detergents? How how does that play into um, you know the selection of the equipment, the selection of the washer chemistry, etc.? Yeah. So in this case, you know, just from some knowing what we were going to be cleaning. You know, there's some industry standards as far as you know bare minimum requirements for washing. So you have an alkaline wash, a rinse, and typically some sort of a post rinse, and then a dry off. I mean mm -hmm. that's fairly standard. Uh, you, you'll get some variations of that, but generally speaking. So we knew that going in, and as we were designing the system, I and mean, this is a, a design that I worked on with with our principal on this. Um, in the fact that we, we wanted it a cabinet style so that it could accommodate the basket loads from either of the furnaces. Okay. So in, in this case, we, we wanted a pre and post wash where um, we could separate the two different cleaning uh, stations uh, prior to the, to the vacuum furnaces. So all the furnaces need clean parts going into them. So we segregated the pre-wash uh, to keep any of the post quench oils out of the system. Uh, mechanically, the um, we had some floor space constraints, but we knew we were going to have to accommodate certain workloads. And so we designed it, commonality between all the furnaces so all the different parts could fit inside. Um, in this case, we also went with all stainless steel construction because we didn't want to introduce any free iron into the system. And then we also worked closely with the chemistry supplier in establishing the uh, chemistry profile of, of the wash, rinse, DI rinse, and then heated blow off. Um, so in, in this system, we work with uh, point one in, in the chemistry supplier that we brought to the table that had experience in cleaning with the heat treat chemistry. Uh, they also handled some of the fluid management that was with some of the other equipment here as well, specifically with the quench oil. Um, confirmed the process, laid it out, designed it such that um, the pre-wash would get the contaminants off of the parts. And then the post wash, we have it so that it'll separate the quench oil from the, the wash bath in order to remove it from the system. So those are all things that go into consideration when you're specking out the, the wash system specifically in a project like this. Now, both washers were designed to accommodate all the variety of size. We have two different sizes of workloads going through the system here. And as you can see, the, uh, the loader here is designed specifically for the washers in the oil quench system. Right, and as I remember, those were uh, 900, 900 uh, in the cross section by... Uh, 36, 48, 36. Yeah, 36, 48, 36, or 900, 900, 1200 uh, millimeters. Um, thank you, Tim. So this loader corresponds with with the CME, uh, or the, the, the oil vacuum quench. oil quench furnace, uh, whereas the, the furnaces we're gonna move to here in a few minutes are actually, uh, 24, 24, 36, or 600, 600, 900 Correct. millimeters. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But those smaller loads are obviously able to be accommodated in the pre-wash or the post-wash here. Right. Maybe through a slightly different mix of fixturing. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Got it. Got so it. fixturing is another animal that comes into play with anybody that has to uh, 
uh, design a heat treat. But that's normally depending on what they're doing, but we had enough things that we had to tackle up front that the fixturing we knew would have to be addressed at some point in time. Uh, we had some general ideas that what we would be able to do so we knew it wasn't going to be super complicated, but um, it would be addressed down the road. So, and with these furnaces being relatively standard furnaces, you know, we knew that um, fixturing and baskets you know, were readily available and we weren't designing something that was completely obscure. Obscure, yeah. So there are two washers on the system and what we're looking at here is the, what they're calling parts washer number two or this would be the post wash. And um, as we develop the chemistry process, you know, Shannon can elaborate a little bit on uh, their conversations with the, the chemistry supplier and what ended up being supplied from, 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 from that individual supplier. Along the process, we, we, we figured out that really there would be an advantage for us to be able to have a, a different chemistry and a different temperature and a different process, different recipe uh, for the post wash. And so that's the primary reason for the second wash is just, uh, just to have something that's completely unique. Um, and obviously it gets used a different amount of times than the, uh, than the pre-wash does. And so obviously it's maintenance schedule and stuff like that is different on a different schedule. So uh, we talked a little bit while we were at the integral, vacuum integral punch furnace or oil punch furnace, um, a little bit about the fact, okay, it's used for hardening. Um, but we also mentioned that not all the materials you're using are oil punching, right? A lot of them can be gas punched. Um, so that brings us to the, the vector furnace behind us here. Um, now, a little bit about that, right? You, because your, say, uh, breadth of, of potential processes was so wide, we didn't go just for hardening, right? We went for other processes, like, you know, maybe solution heat treating or... Carburizing. Carburizing, right, for, so for some surface treating uh, type processes too. Um, so, what did that mean? And, and maybe Tim, uh, for the furnace itself, what did we have to think about as far as additional equipment that would go with that or, or maybe options that we needed to include for those additional processes? Yeah, so I mean, I think it ties back into what we've been talking about all along is about having the system versatility, mm -hmm. overall heat treat system versatility. So the, the vector furnace, you know, there's multiple options for it. Yep. And in this case, you know, we outlined a lot of the options. Most of them were taken, not every single one. But, um, you know, in this case, we added the diffusion pump, which is not, you know, typical. Mm -hmm. But um, in this case, with the materials they were looking at running and the possible processes that they wanted to run, you know, that was something that was worth investing in up front. Uh, they also, we invested in the, uh, the simulation software. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that ties into the versatility and their, their, their newness to the process mm -hmm. that gives them the, uh, the system software to help them develop the recipes. Right. And run the, the preliminary cycles so that they at least have a baseline that's going to get them 95% to where they want to be. Right. And, and so, yeah, that, that ties into the low pressure carburizing part, right? Right. Yeah. So you mentioned that a little bit, Shannon, in that um, it was interesting to have the carburizing uh, capability because you make them fasteners, right? You know, the thread, threads have to be hardened. Um, maybe even the bolt heads need to be hardened, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and that, that uh, simulation software um, kind of bridges the gap, right? Because, you know, if we talk, if, if this was uh, an atmosphere carburizing furnace, we don't really do much other than we condition the furnace and we, yeah, we, yeah, it looks good. And we throw a couple coupons in there and we throw the parts in, right? Um, but, you know, the vacuum and, and LPC portion of that is a little more complicated, right? And um, Tim, can you, what does that software kind of do for us? Uh, it in, gives you the precision and repeatability. Okay. You know, that you don't always get with an atmosphere furnace, especially an older atmosphere furnace. Yep. You know, this is going to be a reliable, repeatable process, which Got is, in their line of work, is going to be mission critical. Yes. So they need to know every time they put a load in here, they're going to get the same results coming out every single time. And I, don't, I think, you know, for us, we don't want to risk, um, you know, the parts here are, they're, you know, they're 
they're end process parts, but they're partially made. It's a very expensive materials. We don't want to risk, you know, you know running test batches. Uh, <laughs> sure. We need to we need to know what the results are going to be. We need to know what we're chasing after. Obviously, know how to measure it when we get done uh, to to be sure that the process is running correctly. But obviously, you have to have a certain degree of uh, uh, predictability in terms of what we're going to put in here. Right. So, kind of the process that that that. Uh, simulation software allows is that you know you can you can develop a recipe for, for low pressure carburizing and you can run a test batch and it'll get you maybe 80% of the way there right absolutely you know? and then you can go back and say all right we didn't like you know we didn't maybe get the case depth we wanted or our hardness was a little off so we're gonna change maybe the amount of diffusion cycle or segments in that recipe or maybe we're gonna change the, um, the the uh, amount of gas that we introduce. Absolutely. Or we, we are going to because we're going to have different load sizes and right. different surface areas. Right. Um, so now we can use that, that uh, SIMVAC or that simulation software to make those changes without running a test batch before every production load, yeah. right? We don't waste the time and money, uh, you know, uh, actually running the furnace. And obviously there's no wear and tear on the furnace right. uh, in our case. I guess the, you know, the cost of running is high as well. Um, so we avoid the maintenance cost of running um, as well. So uh, that said, this, as I recall, this is a 20 bar furnace, right? That's correct. So that also gives you kind of a step up because it's that's a little abnormal, right, Tim? I mean, it, okay, we can do it, but it's not the typical quenching pressure uh, that you see. 20 bar quench. Um, so yeah, this is a 20 bar furnace. Um, you know, adding it up front was a, a small a small investment when you consider the, the whole package, right? right. Yeah. yeah. It was a, a slightly incremental increase in cost of initial capital yeah. to give them the more long-term capability. Knowing some of the other products, again, that Steve the Visionary had in mind of, you know, because some of those parts we're not even talking about today, mm -hmm. uh, that would be able to be run in this furnace, mm -hmm. as well as the nitride. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up, Tim, because, um, you know, that was another, so, you know, most of these, the furnaces we've talked about so far are, you know, the, the core, um, shall we say, hardening furnaces that, that are necessary as a, as a normal step in a heat treat operation, right? Um, but, of course, there are other post operations that are required or not, depending on what the, the process, or excuse me, what the final product wants to be or needs to be. And one of those is uh, the nitriding furnace here. Um, which uh, is both capable of, of nitriding, uh, which of course is another surface finishing uh, um, process, if you will, but it also uh, can use the temper furnace, right? Yeah. Yeah, this system, uh, you know, with Seco's designation is considered a vacuum temper. Mm -hmm. uh, the nitrider, you know, it's a lower temperature process. Mm -hmm. Typically, you're dealing under 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So that falls right in the temper range. So, you know, the uh, point one, you know, did add another higher technology, which we can talk about here in a second with the cryo temper. But this, as their capacity grows, will give them those capabilities to run a vacuum temper. So it's actually under a protected atmosphere, literally a protected atmosphere, right? That to minimize the oxidation and scale on the parts and you know, introduction of. Items that they want in these products. Right, and and also um, this, even though it's vacuum capable, this is also really an atmosphere furnace, right? It's the true atmosphere furnace in our niche. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that the gas nitriding process that we can run here, or, or well, the, the zero flow technology, um, you know, could take place of that LPC. Uh, or the carburizing part if you wanted to, right Shannon? That um, was the intent? Absolutely. Yeah, surface hardening is also part of our repertoire. I mean, there are wear parts and tooling that uh, that deserves uh, or requires um, surface hardening. So uh, that's just another reason why we have this here. Oh, so that's interesting. So this was as much for you as it is maybe for the final product. So, you know, so you had the capability of working on your own tooling and the final product. Yeah, I mean, we deal with thread rolling dyes and uh -huh. and uh, forging, forming and forging dyes uh, every day, and so obviously there's a lot of wear and tear on those and and uh, replacement parts and trying new things, and obviously this gives us the advantage of being able to do that in house when we need to. Interesting. Good. So, um, 
you mentioned a little bit, uh, Tim, about the, the cryo temper uh, opportunities. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that brings to the table? Yeah, so one of the other pieces in line with the system here is a, um, a cryogenic furnace. Mm -hmm. So it actually has the capable capability of running um, sub-zero temperatures, mm -hmm. of minus 190C okay. uh, liquid nitrogen. So it gives them the, the capability to, for wear resistance and for other me mechanical properties of the end materials, okay. to run multiple cycles under a cryogenic or a sub-zero atmosphere. Okay, and you know, you mentioned a little bit about with the nitriding furnace and as their production levels grow, um, having a little, that option as a temper furnace. Now, that's important, right, because the temper cycles are fairly long in comparison to the, the hardening cycles, am I right? Yeah. Okay. Typically, depending on the materials, I mean, up to two to three times hardening cycle. Right, and does the, the cryogenic piece shorten that at all, or is it kind of a material dependent? Type it, it's going to be, you know, typical metallurgist response. It depends. You know, <laughs> um, they, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to depend on the material. But you know, the cryogenic cycles are, you know, typically um, it, it's a multi-step or a ramp process. So it'll go down and then cycle back up, and in some cases they'll do multiple cryo reheat cycles. Yep. Okay. So this furnace itself has the ability to go to, uh, I think it's minus 250 or minus 300 C yep. or Fahrenheit, yep. um, up to this one. About 1200, I believe. 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can go down oh, wow. and up and, and cycle it back and forth depending on what they want to do. And that's, and it, it, it's a, the technology has been widely adapted in the motorsport industry for probably, probably no matter being eight, ten years. And I think so what Don was alluding to is that you know, it does speed up your cycle time in those long temper cycles because you basically get to turn on the air conditioning in the furnace yes. and you cool the furnace yeah. and the parts back down a sure. little faster and you can start another cycle. Um, and obviously it gives us the option of having another temper furnace as well. Yep. You know, I, that adds a, a little bit of a twist on, on the preparation for that piece of equipment, doesn't it? Because it's got a, a unique need uh, because of that liquid nitrogen, right? Yeah, we learned about uh, vacuum jacketed piping um, <laughs> in the process of, uh, of uh, installing that piece of equipment. And uh, obviously it gives you uh, cause to want to put your, your liquid tank or your liquid nitrogen source uh, close, to the, uh, close to the furnace. But uh, just another element, um, you know, of the uh, infrastructure, but uh, an important one for sure. Sounds like an interesting topic for uh, a future discussion that we'll get to here in a little bit. All right, so the last piece to this, uh, Shannon, was the, the aluminum part, right? And uh, so the piece of equipment behind us is uh, aluminum, aluminum uh, solution heat treating uh, setup, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, so can you give us a little flavor for what you're looking for out of, out of this uh, scenario? You bet. So we, uh, we also deal with build aluminum parts and uh, making some engine blocks and uh, other components um, you know, made from build aluminum. And so obviously we needed to be able to heat treat the aluminum as well. And so uh, same, uh, same thing. Um, we, we wanted to have control of the process and want to be able to go right from machining to heat treating um, to uh, on to the last steps of the process. So we brought the aluminum be treating in-house as well. Okay, um, so so this is a solution heat treat quench, and then um, so aluminum is kind of the, the backwards process, right? From from steel, uh, we're we're heating to um, to do a phase transition, but it actually uh, you instead of hardening and then uh, tempering or annealing back, we actually soften and then harden it during the we do the opposite process, shall we say? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So the highlights on this system, knowing a little bit about it, is the fact that it's you know, basically you're, you're running the process around a thousand degrees, give or take, right? You know, a typical furnace like this or other is going to be designed for about 1,200 degrees construction, mm -hmm. um, and it comes out. It's a it has a quick quench on it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it comes out once the door opens. You know, typically, you're going to be out in under 10 seconds, give or take. Mm -hmm. And then it goes directly down into a, a water quench system. Okay. That has the water. The system has a recirculation system on it. It's heated, um, and then it comes out and you drain down. And then normally you'll do some sort of an age process after the fact, Got which it. can be done in either the cryo or even in the, the vacuum temper. Or they have I think, a couple of batch ovens around here that you can batch age 
ah. uh, as needed. So, uh, you know, again, depending on the alloys and what they're doing and what the characteristics that we want to maintain, uh, you'll, you'll normally have some sort of an artificial age after the fact. Got it. Okay. So, um, with that, you know, were there any spe special considerations with this piece of equipment other than placing it and setting it? Were there any other utility uh, type requirements that were needed? Um, it's an electric furnace. This is our only atmosphere furnace. And so, uh, obviously, it's a little harder on our air conditioning system, uh, okay. but sure. uh, not a terrible amount of requirements other than the ventilation. Uh, I'd say the only special consideration, the only premium option, I would say, is just that we do, we do kind of upgrade the uh, speed at which uh, the uh, parts come out of the oven and, and get quenched uh, to uh, uh, you know to comply with some standards there. Ah, okay, great. All right. Well, with that, uh, we're going to take a little break um, and come back and uh, dive into those uh, utility requirements that we mentioned a little earlier and um, the needs and, and requirements that went along with uh, making those and putting those into place and making those things uh, work for the, the equipment that's here. Uh, in our previous discussions, we talked a little bit about the equipment, uh, a little bit about how we how we got here, um, and I think the final part to this whole equation was okay. We uh, we we justified our minds why we want to move heat treating in house. We've investigated the equipment that we need. We bought the equipment. We checked all those boxes. Okay, now what? And you know the the, the I think the next part in that would be you know. Um, what all did you consider when, when it was time to start preparing for the equipment to come in-house? Obviously the, uh, the planning is uh, to a fair amount of effort, uh, but uh, again with, uh, with uh, Seco Partnership and Tim, uh, we, I think we came up with some good plans and uh, implemented them well. But the, uh, the electrical and the cooling um, and the, uh, the process gases um, and the ventilation requirements, I mean obviously uh, I think Don and I walked through uh, yeah. this over and over again. We yeah. obviously want to do our best to get it right. Yeah. But uh, and I think there's 14 or 15 roof penetrations required for the uh, for the uh, hardening furnaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, that's just an example of the level of coordination that, that you have to work with your uh, trades and contractors uh, or uh, uh, tradesmen yep. and uh, 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 piping contractors. And um, it just uh, took a lot of effort. But uh, like I said, it came out well. I think. Well, so yeah, you mentioned uh, quite a bit there, um, you know, so kind of take a step back in the, on the process gas side. So, you know, just thinking about it here, we had, you know, uh, the HPQ furnace, the high pressure quench furnace had nitrogen, it had acetylene for LPC, uh, uh, and in, in your case, argon, right? Because right. Uh, that was a, actually a feature that we didn't talk about, but this, this furnace also has an argon quenching capability. So there were three gases just between those two. Ethylene and, and hydrogen and, uh, and uh, yep, and then the ethylene and hydrogen for the the other to round out the uh, process gases for LPC. Yep. And ammonia then, for nitriding. And then ammonia right. for nitriding, uh, both on the pre night uh, for the hardening furnace, the the vector, and then also for for the nitriding furnace itself. Yep. Um, uh, so you know, quite a wide array of gases. Now, the one thing you know for the HPQ furnace in particular. Um, pretty fast backfill, right? Uh, it has to happen really quick in order to make it work. Yeah. So um, uh, I think I'm not sure I still understand exactly all the <laughs> math, but yeah. luckily you were there to help me with that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so yeah, we're dealing with uh, 500 PSI nitrogen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's backfill in the tank in just a few seconds. And uh, obviously uh, our quench tanks and, uh, uh, or, I'm sorry, the uh, Buffer tanks mm -hmm. when are set up where we can quench all the furnaces at the same time if that were to occur mm -hmm. just uh, naturally in our in our process flow uh, we wouldn't be at risk of running out of gas or anything like that um, and on the cooling system obviously uh, we're cooling all the furnaces at the same time and, and sort of have three stages of cooling um, uh, and again that was something that uh, Tim helped us develop and, and bring in mm -hmm. um, and right so. So those buffer tanks you mentioned actually are kind of off uh, here in our in the background. Um, you know, so those are supplying both or holding both argon and nitrogen for for that the the quench in the in the vector furnace. And um, as you mentioned, that that backfill time is pretty quick. I mean, it's in the usually in the 15 second range That's uh, to to uh, achieve the full effect of the yep. quench. Um, 
So placement of those to, relative to the furnace was a consideration. Big Absolutely. Consideration. Yeah, and, and to, uh, to minimize the cost of the pipe leak and obviously just the physical infrastructure um, environment, you know, in our environment, um, obviously you want to get those things all as close together as you can. And then the bulk storage tanks, of course, are right outside. Um, the heat treat area here uh, where those uh, gases are stored in bulk. Yeah, and actually, there, <laughs> it's funny because you mentioned uh, gas or, or um, piping runs, and the one important piping run that we kind of mentioned in the past that really isn't the gas, but it's tied to this because it's still nitrogen, it's liquid nitrogen, right? And uh, to the cryo temper furnace, which is vacuum jacketed, you said? It is, yep. It, uh, the whole pipe is uh, vacuum jacketed so that uh, you can maintain the, uh, the temperature of the liquid um, as it comes in. And so we're obviously trying to keep the liquid as cold as possible um, between the uh, storage tank and delivery to the furnace. Yeah, I bet you had to go uh, take out a loan just for that that pipe, didn't you? Uh, it was a surprising uh, initial quote. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. Well, we did warn you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, just as a rough I mean, general rule of thumb, I mean, depending on what part of the country, and I mean, normal you know, copper piping, you know, what is what it is, but yeah, sure. that type of jacketed piping, you're talking three to four hundred bucks a foot. Cool. So you can see Ouch. The, the relative magnitude of... And the relative importance of uh, placing the uh, tank exactly. uh, close to the, uh, yeah. to the uh, use, use so spot. Well, Layout's it's, important. It's not the in, inside tanks either. We're talking about the actual liquid system that sits outside, That's right? right. Yeah. Um, also, you mentioned uh, Tim Copper. Um, so in this case, Shannon, you decided to use copper for for um, you know for both gas and argon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Tim, how often do you run across that in in your travels? As far as that you remember seeing copper versus maybe uh, welded pipe used for for utility gas distribution. For utility gas, I would say you know probably more recently, I, I've seen a lot more copper because okay. it's, it just seems to be an easier. Uh, thing for customers to use because they're they've got contractors are on site doing piping work already mm -hmm. um, and the cost of install the cost of ins I mean it might be a little bit more an initial investment yeah. but the, the cost to put it together I mean hell it's easy enough that I can do it you know well but that that was I guess the the point that I had in mind is despite it being more expensive the ease of installation is enough installation. that, yeah. that it, it uh, you know the time and you know, dealing with weld spatter and all that other stuff that comes with uh, installing welded pipe, it's still a more attractive option. Just got it very clean, doesn't need to be painted. Yeah, though that's right. another good point, does not need to be painted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, you know, I guess the other thing I'd like to touch on there is, um, and, and we can do this in a few minutes, but uh, acetylene. So how did you handle that situation? Because acetylene, as I recall, comes in uh, at a relatively low pressure unless we get to a really massive system, but you didn't need that kind of volume for this furnace, right? Right, so uh, we decided to do uh, cells or groups of cylinders mm -hmm. um, to, to give us the pressures and volumes that we're working with. Yeah. Um, and so we're you know, getting those from our gas provider um, you know, in a bulk pack um, yeah. and treating them, you know, the, the basically when they come uh, joined together and get treated as one cylinder as far as the supply. Okay, but still distributed at only 15 PSI or so, right? That's correct, yeah. One of the things I'd like to point out that um, as far as this phase of the installation is that the, the importance I think that we all understood and in, in, in point one was that, that, that really stuck out I think as a success for me was the, the communication and the project management that went on with this between the three of us and, and others, you know, our regular communication, especially early on when we were doing the layout of the system because we did, we were moving a lot of furniture. I mean, we had... You know, we're moving stuff around because there was, you know, building constraints as far as the columns and working around the loaders and, un, you know, the loading and unloading equipment and making sure we can make the turns. And, you know, there was some slight tweaks to the building openings as yeah. far as where the door locations were in order to accommodate some of our equipment. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we also worked, you know, with the equipment suppliers. I remember specifically on the cooling system. You know, we made some modifications to the size of the cooling skids and how we arranged the pump arrangements, you know, up front while it was still done on, on CAD, where it, the cost of change is literally nothing versus once it got on site. So I, I can't stress the, the importance of, you know, anybody that's looking at this going forward in tackling a system like this is making sure they have a, a strong project manager 
that understands the, the importance of that. And Shannon was great as far as, as managing those details, mm -hmm. and you know, sending us you know cartoons, you know, of hey, can we do this, and, and, and marking things up. So and that also helped, I think, in laying out. I mean, you can see what a clean piping arrangement we've got here, and the fact that he worked with his building guys. Then after we got the layouts finalized, to, to talk about how we wanted to have everything nice and clean and organized as far as all the utilities and uh, you know to, to help in, in tying it in with, with everything being installed. Yeah and, and further to the point Tim you know there's really two ways you can tackle this and, and one way is to, to handle it in this in that manner uh, as Shannon did where we have regular conversations and we basically do um, a detailed layout as far as the position of all the equipment considering all those items and maintenance accessibility too. Of course, right. um, but or, or the other option is to go all out and have you know everything engineered, including all the pipe runs and all of the, uh, uh, um, uh, I guess the entire utilities system yep. laid out, which can be costly. Sure. But the, the point is, is that working with uh, the the contractor and a little bit of knowledge and maybe a tad bit of engineering just to finish things like you know maybe uh, pipe stanchions and that sort of thing that are structural, uh, you can work out the details um, because you know. The, the, the distances here and pipe runs are relatively small, uh, which you know when we get to the water system, uh, you know are, are built into the the assumptions made as far as you know we we'd expect some uh, pipe runs to be in the system. So uh, you're you're exactly right, Tim. Having those regular conversations to make sure all those aspects are taken into consideration is very important. Uh, otherwise. You know, we could get here and realize that you know we've got equipment too close to each other yep. to, to maintenance, which okay, we can live with it, but boy, we really wouldn't have done it that way yep. had we thought about it ahead of time. I think as a team, I mean, it's it is complex, but it is manageable. I mean, again, we did have good communication, did have good uh, back and forth. I think the benefit, I mean, for us is, I mean, it's a it's a very attractive installation. I mean, it looks it's 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 uh, it's uh, consistent with the rest of our facility. It's something that we're very proud of. But it's also just space conservation. I mean, we worked over and over again about uh, how to maintain the maintenance requirements of the machines and be able to access the things that are most likely or most frequently maintenance um, while conserving our square footage uh, in our yep. building. And uh, again, I think we arrived at, you know, again, there was back and forth there too. Sure. But I think we arrived at a place that's, uh, that's right. Sure, yeah. So you bring up a good point. You know, the um, uh, floor space is always a premium, right? You know, it doesn't matter whether we're, we're installing heat treating furnaces or machines or office furniture, floor space is always a premium because it's costly to maintain, yeah. right? So, uh, yeah, definitely all important points. Um, okay, so process gases are one thing. Tim, you, I think, and, and Chan, you both mentioned a little bit about the, the cooling system. So, in this setup, the, all the vacuum furnaces require cooling, right? Uh, and the um, the nitriding furnace in as well, uh, maybe not to the extent, yeah, the others, but a smaller amount. Um, how did we how did we go about tackling that, and what all did that consist of? Well, you know, it, it's it's not rocket science, but there's some basic details yet we had to figure out. Mm -hmm. uh, once we nailed down what the final furnaces were going to be purchased or that they wanted to to acquire, you know, we worked with uh, our cooling supplier my cooling supplier fluid cooling systems mm -hmm. and worked with their engineers and said okay hey here's the the amount of water that we need to cool on a normal basis and here's what we need to cool on a maximum basis if everything's going all out mm -hmm. at one given point in time so you know the, the 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 easiest way to describe this we then size the system according to that so we have an open loop skid mm -hmm. that uh, the water is cooled with an outside uh, cooling tower and then we cool that loop, and then there's an, an internal closed loop system that's protected mm -hmm. that um, runs all the, the cooling loops on the furnaces. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a system that feeds in, so as it's pressure controlled, so as more cooling is required, the pumps pump faster, and then uh, slow down as needed near the end of the quench cycles. Yeah. And then we also had, uh, in designing it, you know, and the proper way to do it is, is having a redundant backup system so that, you know, if one pump goes down, you, you've got a backup pump. And Tim, do you recall, was uh, glyc was it a glycol water mixture yeah. used in the, on the yeah. interior loop? Yep. Yeah. And yep. then uh, on the outside, is it, uh, and forgive me, because I don't remember, is it a, an evaporative tower or is it? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's all water. Mm -hmm. 
And what about water treatment? Did you have your your uh, water treatment folks in? The That's to right. Take the chemistry care? folks came in and they helped us keep the water bug free. Yep. And uh, and uh, maintained well yep. uh, in all temperatures and stuff like that because it does go outside summer and winter. Right. And and not only that, I mean, you're you're still in the point where you're kind of ramping up, so it's not like you're running processes. You yeah, know, we seven don't days run every week. single day. Uh, uh, you know, our cooling system not running every single day, so that is uh, something we have to we have to tend to the uh, storage. Yep. Uh, the water in storage to make sure that it's not growing uh, uh, bad things. Bad things, yeah, right, yeah, and bacteria that can cause problems, right. right. Okay, um, so, you know, the, the main thing there was, uh, like you say, is considering all the needs of the system. And, and, and Tim, you brought up a good point that it's not just the steady state or the normal uh, cooling needs, it's also when the furnace is going to quench, right, right. You know, that, that we've got to consider, uh, which is a significantly higher flow rate, I mean, to the point that we might be at, say, 75 gallons a minute just for steady state and then we're jumping up to you know 300 or 350 gallons a minute for uh for quench and maybe not quite that extreme but still yeah. in that range yeah uh, and the other point on, on cooling because you know we get involved with other projects as well that aren't all system based like this sure. is that you know not every system requires a full-blown central system like this right but this was the most practical way to go about it as far as lease maintenance, the initial investment was you know, probably on par or maybe a little bit less than uh, you know, if a standalone furnace is sold, normally it has a small cooling system on it that's sure. dedicated to that furnace. Mm -hmm. Or if you're adding a furnace you know, to an existing system that's maxed out on capacity, mm -hmm. you know, here we had the, the, the benefit of basically starting from scratch and uh, we could design a central system that would accommodate everything that's here. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, two different approaches is kind of we talk about the big picture stuff. Right, and there also could be those other instances where maybe the, there is a plant-wide system yeah. in existence, right? And all we really need is a, another another skid, as we tend to refer to yeah. it, with just a pump to circulate to and from the furnace Mostly. that ties yeah. into that existing outside yep. or main cooling system. We're actually, uh, we've, as you guys have been here, we've actually, we realize our capacity is, is you know, designed around uh, you know, maximum use of the furnaces, and obviously that's not an everyday thing for us here. So we actually have extended our system out to the some of the other shop floor and okay. cooling some of our induction heating equipment and oh, stuff okay. like that. Good, uh, sure. And it works very, very well. For Good. That. Good. Good, very, very well. Yeah, no. yeah, and you know, then that's always an opportunity, so long as the timing is 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 always kept in in. in we didn't even charge you for that. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so we <clears throat> that, that covers the process gases, in which we'll take a step outside and look at the exterior part of these systems here in a moment. Um, but process gas, uh, water cooling, of course electric, all the furnaces we looked at today were, were electric. Um, any special notes there? Well, I mean, it's just like everything else. I mean, it's a, a fairly large amount of electric. So sure. you have three and four and 500 amp services, uh, depending on the furnaces yeah. uh, at 480. Yeah, so it is a you know, fairly large requirement, and obviously there's a cost of that. Yep. But uh, just like everything else, it has to be piped and, uh, and uh, managed with uh, your electrical infrastructure. Sure, sure. Um, I guess being in a building, you had the pleasure of laying that out ahead of time, or the, the um, opportunity to lay that all out ahead of time. Did you make any provisions for any future equipment in, when you were thinking that through, or you know? we, we did, okay. and, and even future buildings, uh, okay. as uh, as is required. Yeah. But uh, obviously, in our case, I mean, obviously, our, our major loads are here, yep. you know, in the uh, heat treating area, and so our electrical, um, our, our main electrical system, main electrical service is very near uh, the uh, heat treating system. You know, for that reason, obviously, to keep the uh, links of uh, wire sure. as short as possible and make uh, changing or moving it easily. Sure. Um, yeah, because oftentimes, uh, at least, and Tim can probably attest to this too, that's always a, a sticking point because, okay, you know, customer will come, they want to add capacity, but they check all the boxes and then they get to the electrical and say, oh boy, you know, now we have to go add a new tram. I mean, the panel board is one thing, right? You know, right. adding circuits is not a, as big a deal, but now all of a sudden they realize that their transformer is out of capacity. And now we're talking about going to the utility to add a new transformer, and now it went from you know ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and from you know a two to three week lead time to get all the parts to, to you know six to eight months to get a new transformer. So you know these are all important considerations that have to come in the very upfront part of the the initial capital investment. Otherwise, 
that ends up being a, a huge headache later on. And, and okay, are there ways to work around limiting the electricity consumption? Yes, but with a huge sacrifice in fur furnace performance to the, the point you may not be able to quench, you'll have to sacrifice heating rate. I mean, it, it goes down the list, but we can do it, but don't like to. Right. We consider this to be building number one. No, yeah, all right. That's what we like to hear. Another heat treat shop coming, right? I think so. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think, um, you know, the, the only other thing that comes to mind was, of course, we had a couple pieces of equipment here that had uh, physical building impacts, right? Uh, other than just making sure that we had a, a floor adequate to hold it, uh, we had pits, right? Um, what came across the table when we started talking about pits that, that stuck in your mind? Precision, I think, is the uh, first thing that comes to mind. I mean, because obviously you want to get it right if you're going to put a hole in your floor, but you have three pieces of equipment that uh, that require uh, pits. Um, they're 42 or to 48 inches deep, I believe. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the physical size and weight of the machine is, is down low, and so that placement became even more critical to uh, get that exactly right and get the size exactly right so that when they get dropped in the hole, they do fit. Right, because, I mean, now we're talking about a different foundation underneath the pit at a different elevation, different soil conditions, all that fun yeah, stuff. Concerns about flooding and that sort of thing, drainage. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and actually, so did you include, I mean, both of those pieces of equipment that I can think of are the washers and the oil quench furnace. They both have fluid in them as it, as it is, right? Right. So did you make any special considerations in case there's a leak? I mean, you have to we want we one or plan on one, but... We did put a sump in uh, all three pits uh, just in case we need to uh, pump out liquid there. Okay, and you don't have to actively uh, pump water or anything out of these pits, right? No, no, uh, they are sealed up, but we did take provision for uh, sealing them up. So there are no pumps there, uh, and obviously we did want to create a situation where we might spill something that might be hazardous to automatically pump it out in the sewer or something like that. So okay, gotcha. there's no pumps in the uh, bits uh, as a standard. Okay, right, because there is an environmental consideration, right? I mean, we've got oil and the, even the water and the washers has uh, right. detergent in it, so we don't want to just, you know, if there is a leak, they have to be, it has to be managed and disposed of properly. Sure. Right. Okay. Um, okay, uh, moving a bit on beyond that, you know, now that you're, okay, um, and like I say, we'll take a step outside and talk a little bit more about the, the installation pieces, but now that you're using the equipment, um, has anything come up that, that you know, has surprised you on a maintenance or, or uh, uh, preventive maintenance standpoint you know, that, that has surprised you or that you had to, to you know, take into consideration? I don't think a surprise. I mean, I think we're, I mean, I think we're, I think we're uh, you know, pleasantly surprised in that so far maintenance has been light. Uh -huh. uh, maybe even lighter than we expected. Um, I think the usability of the machine and the user interfaces and just the overall uh, quality um, of the uh, setup is something we're, I mean, we're super happy with. Great. And I think uh, I think our guys who uh, operate the equipment every day, uh, you know, feel comfortable that they can walk up to it and trust what they're seeing on the user interface mm -hmm. and trust when they're putting our parts in these that they're going to come out the way they want. Well, that's, that's certainly good news. That's great to hear, uh, you know, from our perspective. Um, okay. Well, great. So uh, let's take a step outside and we'll uh, take a look at the equipment out there. Sounds great. It's a nice day. All right. Okay. So we've moved outside uh, just to, to get a brief shot of the uh, uh, gas utilities as they sit outside along with uh, uh, the water system. Um, so uh, Shannon, can you give us a little flavor for what we see behind us here? Yeah, we've got the uh, the uh, high pressure uh, nitrogen tank, 500 psi uh, mm -hmm. gas storage tank, and then the uh, ethylene glycol tank for the uh, cooling system, for mm -hmm. the closed loop cooling, and then the uh, liquid nitrogen uh, uh, storage tank, and then of course over to our left, uh, we've got the uh, cooling tower for the uh, outside loop uh, of the cooling system. Yep. Um, just to, you know around the, the nitrogen, not liquid nitrogen, but the gaseous nitrogen. Do you uh, you know? At your present time, how, what's the relationship with the gas supplier as far as usage and refills, and how does that all work? So they actually have telemetry on the tanks, and they uh, they come by at their leisure basically to uh, fill the tanks. But of course, they never let us drop below uh, the minimum threshold. Right. But they usually fill at night, so they have access control, or they have access to our premises uh, on their own. Okay. And uh, they come by and fill up. But sometimes they uh, give us a full fill, and sometimes they're just dropping off what they have as they uh, come down the highway. Okay. But uh, they do uh, take care of us uh, on that automatically. Okay. 
uh, that's that's good so it's not something you have to manage because that, that is a good point you know for the nitrider we have to maintain a, uh, a minimum uh, to be sure that we converge uh, in the case of an emergency right so absolutely uh, that is important that we do have enough you know, available and it's also our backup cooling system uh, in the event of a total electrical failure we, we have a uh, pump that runs off the uh, nitrogen to uh, to um, to uh, circulate cooling at least at a some level to uh, cool right. the furnaces right and you know that's an interesting point because you know not everybody decides to do that you know Tim you can comment to this too like you know some customers I'm sure use compressed air for that right yeah but uh, most places if you're doing the heat treat they got nitrogen already so right. the nitrogen is kind of a natural and then it's you're always gonna have it right even if the power goes out right so um, that's you know normally would be the default if we're gonna use a yeah uh, air operated pump right and it's not one for one right because I mean here we've got 500 psi in storage you know that that pump is usually you operating somewhere around like 100 or 125 psi so yeah you know, step that, it down that nitrogen even even if you're on the low end would still last a really long time very very long time so uh you know, typically not an issue um uh let's see uh, what about the liquid nitrogen do they fill that at their leisure too or actually our setup is set so they can service both tanks in one truck okay uh, great. which is convenient obviously it uh, helps with the cost yeah. of the uh, supply as well so they do uh, service uh, both tanks uh, from the same uh, from the same truck, yep. and um, yeah, they come by. It's the same thing. They've got telemetry on that tank as well, mm -hmm. and so it's the, they will come by and, and fill both tanks sometimes if uh, as required. And then we mentioned there were a couple other gases here. So uh, argon, you haven't uh, made a, a full installation for that yet. Yeah, we're just using a bulk pack cylinders uh, okay. right now uh, for that because our consumption is low. Yep. In the same way with. Uh, uh, ammonia and uh, the other uh, process gases, the ethylene and hydrogen. Right, right. Yeah, so, um, you know, again, something maybe in the future if your usage goes up to justify having a liquid system for the ammonia or... Uh, um, Probably uh, acetylene as well. Yeah, and then a gas, uh, another yeah, gas right. tank for the argon. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. That you would, you know, had a couple spots set aside for, but they're not, not here yet. That's correct. Yeah, so uh, I can understand, you know, like even the nitrogen we can hear kind of run in the background here. Uh, you naturally lose a little bit just because of the it's refrigerated as it heats yep. up, especially in these warm days. Yep, building uh, up pressure, so it's blowing off if you're not we're, using it. We're blowing, yeah. So we're using it whether we're using it or yep. not, right? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, so that's an ongoing cost has to be considered. Of course. Uh, and and you know, of course, with the cylinders though. When we're not using it, we're not using it. That's correct. That's an advantage on the uh, on the cylinders for right now, where the consumption is much lower. Uh, you know, where, when we're not using it, there's no loss, no loss at all. Yeah. Obviously, you can start indefinitely. Great. Okay. Yeah, the good consideration for at least uh, an operation like this where you're just getting on, uh, figuring out what you're going to need. Yep. Uh, a convenient option. That's correct. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and then. You know, as far as the uh, the uh, water cooling system, if I could shift gears here for a second. So, Tim, um, what was the, the benefit over using a cooling tower, uh, excuse me, a evaporative tower in this instance versus like uh, normal heat exchangers that, that are positioned outside? Is there a weather consideration, climate consideration? Well, you, you got to take a look at, um, you know, where what part of the country it's going to be installed. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the thing with with our situation here, it does get tend to get a little warm here in the summer, mm -hmm. you know. And just using an air cooled heat exchanger probably wasn't going to cut it as far as maintaining a consistency. Mm -hmm. So, which is why we ended up opting with uh, the water cooled system right. to uh, to make sure that it's a uh, it's cold when it needs to be cold. Yeah, we at least get get it, take it's advantage consistent. of the uh, uh, um, the difference in the, the dry bulb temperature. Yep. Bulb. Exactly. Yep. yep. Um, then uh, the other thing when you look at options you know because we you and I can talk about this as far as another case that we had sure you know it, it is a little more expensive to go this route yep. but again it gives you that consistency and repeatability that that these guys were looking for in, in this part of the country you know when you use an air-cooled system um, you know the the square footage for the amount of cooling that we were going to need mm -hmm. gets to be excessive um, you know, if you're dealing with one furnace, you know, it's a smaller unit, you got a couple fans, but, you know, in a case like this, 
and you'd probably be looking at a 15 to 20 fan arrangement mm -hmm. that would gobble up half this parking lot. Yeah. So, you know, floor space, you know. And the operational cost of this is low. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yep, it's, it's very low. Yeah, there's a little bit more maintenance, right? Because you've got to make up water. Right. Uh, you've got to treat that water. Uh, we've got to make sure we're not, like you said, growing, yeah. growing uh, bugs, bugs. Yep. Uh, in, in the tank. But on the flip side, you know, maintaining all those banks of fans and looking at them out here in the parking lot or up there on the roof, wherever they end up being, can be just as problematic. Plus, we still may not get the temperature we really want to yeah. in certain times of the year. Right. Um, okay. Uh, flip side, wintertime, do you see a real whole lot, a lot of change in the maintenance or any requirements that you, you face so far in that? No, it's uh, since it always drains back to inside the building. Yep. Uh, there's no concerns about the winterizing or anything like that. I and mean, we can start and stop, you know, in below freezing yep. and be okay. And uh, the system still operates fairly efficiently yep. and we can get to our desired operating temperatures uh, in any temperature. And if it doesn't freeze, don't have a big, big problem because of that? No, sir. All right, well, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've covered the, the bulk of the, the stuff out here. Um, and with that, thank you very much for uh, attending this uh, session in uh, the eSeminar 4.1, and we look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>